Hello, good morning. Um, here we are on um, voting day. Please do not forget to vote. Um, here we are, um, sustainability webinar, 2nd of May, West London Chambers. Uh, lovely to be back doing a Zoom webinar. We have an interesting panel of speakers for you this morning. Um, I can see that people are logging in, so we'll make a start. Um, I always quite like to start these webinars by trying to actually give a def definition of net zero, really just for my um, brain to get, get my head around it. Um, with the scale of extreme weather we've seen over the past few years, and the latest being um, the extreme rainfall in Dubai, with as much rain falling in 24 hours than they usually get in 18 months, few people um, will now deny that we are facing a climate emergency. Um, the scientific evidence is clear. Emissions of greenhouse gases resulting from human activity are causing our climate to change. OK, so, so here comes the science. Carbon dioxide is emitted when fossil fuels are burnt to meet our demand for energy. Although it isn't the only greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide is the most significant. As such, the term carbon emissions is often used to talk about all greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, to address the problem in June 2019, the UK became the first major economy to pass legislation that commits the country to net zero emissions by 2050. In other words, the target is to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions by 100 percent relative to 1990 levels by the middle of this century. But it's interesting that our politicians seem to be pulling back a little. Votes seem a bit more important. Let's see what today brings. Um, I've tried to explain net zero. Our first speaker, uh, Nikki Sinker of Audertel, is going to give a few more definitions, setting the scene and giving introduction to climate actions for SMEs. Nikki, please take the floor. Could, could everyone turn their cameras on, do you think? Sounds good. Thank you so much, Sally. Brilliant. It's, it's a really good introduction, um, and I will hopefully build upon that to give you all a little bit more confidence about using the right terminology, but also understand why climate action is so important for your business and how you go about it. So I'm Nikki Sinker from Auditel. I'm a carbon specialist. We don't have long to cover quite a complex subject, so I'm going to go straight into it. Um, as Sally said, you know, when we're talking about climate action impact for organisations, we often talk about carbon footprinting and carbon reduction plans. So the first point that I'd like to start on is just building on what Sally just said in terms of when we're talking about carbon, we're actually talking about the seven different greenhouse gases that have been identified as having the impact on the environment that we're seeing occurring. And so when we're going to look at your carbon footprint, we measure it in tons of CO2 equivalent, which is effectively measuring all of these different gases and then applying a conversion factor to bring them back to an equivalent ton of CO2, given it was the predominant uh, gas when the measure was being um, invented effectively. So having determined a common term, which is carbon, and a common measurement, which is tons of CO2e, when we were thinking about you know, what organizations need to be doing in terms of their impact on the environment, it was decided that we needed to really break down those emissions into some pretty simple buckets so they could understand how they can go about looking at their carbon emissions. So that's where scope one, scope two, and scope three came about. So scope one, is the burning of fossil fuels in your company facilities and in your company vehicles. Scope two is then any form of plumbed electricity coming into your organization, sorry, plumbed energy coming into your organization where the burning of fossil fuels is happening upstream. So it's your electricity usage. But you then have the everything else and that is scope three. And there's 15 different subcategories of scope three emissions, which are shown on this slide. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just to give you an idea of some of the main categories, it'll be things like employee commuting, which include homeworking emissions, and will be business travel, waste from operations, and the transport and distribution of goods and services into your organization and out of your organization. And when we talk about the scopes, we quite like to show this diagram of the iceberg, because scope one and scope two is that tiny bit of the iceberg that you can see above the water. It's generally easier to measure and to manage. You know, for scope one and scope two, you get most of the information you need on your energy bills, but the huge majority of your emissions are your scope three emissions. And they're much more complex to measure and to manage. They're that bit of the iceberg below the water. 
Now, Sally mentioned some of the terminology, um, so net zero and carbon neutral. There's often confusion around these two terms. And so I just wanted to really emphasize a little bit of what Sally was saying there. So you talk, you, when you hear, what you hear most often is that net zero. So what Sally said in terms of really only achieving net, so achieving net zero is only when you've measured your emissions and then you're balancing those emissions with absolute carbon removal or reduction. That is completely different to carbon neutral and carbon neutral can, is something that can be um, achieved in the short term because you can achieve it by buying offsets. So you measure your carbon footprint, you reduce your carbon footprint, and then you can buy offsets. Carbon in net zero, you can't buy offsets. So it's a much longer term target. And for some organizations, carbon neutral is an early step on that longer term, you know, 10, 20 year net zero journey. It's also worthwhile talking a little bit about um, two different calculations of carbon footprint that we do. So the first one, which really applies to, to any organization is your organizational carbon. So that's all the emissions associated within the operational boundaries and within your control. We also calculate embodied carbon and embodied carbon is for a product. So really we, we call it cradle to gate emissions for a particular product. So the moment those, you know, everything that's making that object is coming out and being extracted from the earth to the moment that you are disposing of that object. So it's two different calculations that are just worthwhile mentioning. Now, why is carbon management so important for organizations? So we've talked about some of the terminology, but why should you care? <laughs> um, and I think, you know, that's why it's really important to, to talk about this slide. There's a huge number of market forces for organizations that are driving them to manage their carbon. So the first, we obviously see increasing amount of consumer demand. People want to buy from organizations who are doing the right thing by the climate. We also see increasing amounts of legislative requirements, and we really see that increasing almost on a daily basis. One, one piece to just pull out is the PPN 0621, which is a public procurement notice that was issued in 2021, which required anyone submitting for a bid for government work over 5 million to accompany that tender submission with a carbon reduction plan. The NHS adopted that PPN notice as well, but as of last month, they actually removed the 5 million barrier. So any work for the NHS now requires you to put in your carbon reduction plan as part of your tender submission. So what we're seeing is this ripple effect through the supply chain. So that even if you don't need to meet the legislative requirements or you're not supplying the government, if you're supplying a business that is, as they work through their carbon reduction plan, they might have initially started looking at scope one and scope two, but as they look at their scope three, they're going to tap you up as a supplier and they're going to ask what your carbon credentials are. So we're really seeing more, um, the more work is being won by organizations that are managing their carbon. It's also, also worthwhile saying that it's not just work that they're winning, we're also seeing them winning more talent because the younger generation really care about this area. They want to work for organizations that are doing the right thing by the environment. And then the last thing that's driving people to manage their carbon is costs. So obviously energy costs massively increased a couple of years ago, huge additional burden on a lot of organizations. Now, when you go through your carbon management journey, obviously a lot of that is about driving energy efficiencies and driving energy reduction. So it reduces your cost and therefore a number of organizations embarked upon this journey with us to reduce their cost in their business. So whilst there's all these things driving organizations to do this, there's obviously on the flip side challenges, the so things that are stopping people from managing their carbon. Often people lack the internal expertise. How on earth are they going to calculate the carbon footprint? Seems like too big a challenge. How on earth am I going to go about doing all of this? There's a lot of confusion, uh, particularly around things like the terminology. And that confusion sometimes leads to fear. People don't want to do something because they're scared about doing it incorrectly or saying the wrong thing. Um, and greenwashing is absolutely an element of that, which we'll touch on shortly. And then there's this perception of cost, you know, with everything that businesses have been through in the last few years, just feel like this is another cost to their business. 
Um, but obviously, as I just said, you know, majority of our work is very much self-funding because you go through this journey, you find efficiencies in the business and it effectively um, you know, is self-funding because the most carbon efficient business is just a very efficient business. Now, it is worthwhile just touching base on one bit of legislation um, because it does impact companies that we're importing into the EU, and that is the EU Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. So at the moment, it applies to the products that you can see on this slide, but it will expand out over time to include other products like paper, glass, etc. And effectively, it will impact any organization importing into the EU. And one of the main things to note on this is that as of the 1st of January 2025, so next year, when you import goods into the EU, you'll need to be including information about your embodied carbon in those products. So either you're giving that information to the importer, or if you are the importer yourself, you'll have to, you'll have to be declaring that information. So if you do import or you're planning to import as part of your growth plans, it is worthwhile finding out more. You know, don't, don't hesitate to get in touch. The other piece of um, information that I did say I would touch base on is greenwashing um, because there's a lot more attention on this at the moment. So greenwashing is effectively making a green claim where you're not making the meaningful difference that is stated is being made. Um, there's a huge amount of scrutiny on green claims at the moment. It's something that the Advertising Standards Authority are really focused on. There was a recent EU directive. There's fines now of up to 10% of your global revenue if you're found to be making a green claim and it's actually not supported by verifiable evidence. So, you know, obviously it's great for business to be able to make a green claim. Fantastic in terms of brand profile, win more work. But when you are making those, please do make sure that they are backed up with evidence to support those claims. So whether that be embodied carbon calculations, et cetera, because um, you can find there's a lot of reputational damage, but also fines if you're not. So just at a very high level, how do companies manage their carbon? How do you manage your emissions? There's four key steps. So the first and the most important is measurement. Where are you today? You measure your carbon footprint. Um, you can't reduce what you can't measure, so you always have to start with that step. You then set targets for your carbon management journey. You then put together implementable plans to reduce your carbon. And then we also verify that. So we have someone independent to those calculations, verify that those are accurate to really make sure that there's credibility to anything that you're doing. As I mentioned, the net zero, net zero journey is very much a journey. So you're basically carrying out those steps on an annual basis to reach over time this point of net zero. So you're reducing your emissions over time and reaching net zero. It is just worthwhile noting that not all carbon footprints are the same. And as I said, this is one of the reasons why there's a huge amount of confusion in this space. So some people just calculate scope one and scope two are not necessarily clear that they're not calculating scope three, although we are increasingly seeing customers ask for very detailed information and really requesting scope three. You see some organizations that have just calculated the carbon footprint for one office and they're not necessarily clear that they've not, not included everything else. You see some organizations calculating their carbon footprint using spend-based data, which is really, you know, there's no correlation between spend and emissions. Um, so, you know, it's very, when you've got the hierarchy of data, it's the lowest quality of data that you can use. It also drives the wrong business decisions because the only way you can reduce your emissions then is to reduce your spend. Um, and it's also worthwhile noting that when you do calculations, you can calculate using conversion factors we spoke about earlier the worse the data that you're using the higher the conversion factors so you're likely to have a higher carbon footprint when we're calculating we always cover scope one scope two scope three we're very transparent about our methodologies being used and we use internationally recognized calculations so ghg protocols and iso standards last slide i promise um, so obviously measurement's really important. You then set targets and then you move on to carbon reduction. And there's really three buckets of reduction activity that we see. So the first is behavioral. Um, often this is where you can have the most impact, but it's also sometimes the most complex. Um, how can you engage people to change the way that they are behaving in order to reduce their impact on the environment? 
and that's you know your staff but it can also be your clients and your suppliers and so we do quite a lot of training for example in order to um, sort of drive behavioral change the second bucket is then capital projects so things like solar panels biomass boilers etc often there's only one of these in any given year because you want to sort of spread out capital expenditure we also often only start capital projects in year two because actually what we're doing is we're finding cost savings in year one to fund some of those capital projects in year two. And then the third bucket is procurement. So things like switching to renewable energy or um, you know, consolidation of your supply chain, et cetera. So hopefully that has given you a little bit of an idea of all things, um, terminology, process, et cetera. Um, and we will have an opportunity for some questions, I think, later. Thank you very much indeed, Nikki. Gosh, as you say, it is it is a big, it's a big topic, isn't it? And a bit sort of scary. Um, uh, this week, uh, a few days ago, it was um, the Net Zero conference at Olympia, which I know Mohammed was at and and had a stand. I was hoping to go, um, but but yeah, time poor, so I wasn't able to be there. But I do think members of our team were there, which is great. So Mohammed, do you want to sort of speak about that and then about the importance of um? Uh, funding innovation yes of course thank you thank you sally and uh, thank you for inviting me for uh, for this webinar um just one thing thank you also nikki for this presentation i think you know from from innovation zero i think we noticed that actually there is a need to change and usually it's difficult to change um and uh, raising awareness and educating people why they need to change is very important and necessary and and this is part of of what uh, nikki was saying but also part of uh, why innovation zero was such a critical event uh, as well here in london and um, you know it was such an inspiring event it's for it's the second year that it's happening and it's becoming the largest decarbonization event in the uk but it's not only talking about the UK, it's attracting actually uh, people from all over the world. Um, and it's it's amazing to see such an events happening here, bringing together policymakers, um, governments, uh, internationals as well, international companies, but also major companies, banks and innovators. Um, and innovators are very important in this whole transformation that's happening uh, towards uh, net zero. But you know, like, so, so basically uh, just, just a brief about Innovation Zero, it brought over 10,000 attendees, whether from the UK or from international countries. And there were around 600 speakers and more than 250 exhibitors um, from diverse backgrounds, uh, all uh, having the same aim is how to actually tackle climate uh, crisis and how to achieve net zero. Um, and there were a few topics that were highlighted, although the program was immense, was amazing. There was a lot of dynamics around a lot of uh, uh, sessions happening, uh, tackling different topics uh, from the finance side all the way to the innovation actions that are happening in the UK and abroad. Um, but ma major, major uh, themes that were highlighted really one is that there is a big necessity for innovation, collaboration, and funding to come together, which are very critical to achieve the net zero future. The second is the role of government, which is very important in seeding innovation and de-risking technologies in order to attract more investors, but in order to also uh, uh, push innovations and solutions into the market. Uh, but also one of the most important thing is that the transformation is going to also touch the whole society and the economy as well. Um, and it has to be powered by innovation and by entrepreneurship to create solutions that will be of benefits to everyone involved. So the, here comes the need really for inclusion and education around these topics. But, you know, yes, there are a lot of challenges, but also there are a lot of opportunities uh, that were highlighted. One of the challenges are the funding, uh, the funding needs and gaps. And especially for um, early stage innovators, early stage startups are bringing amazing innovation into, into the market. Um, and however, you know, the, although, you know, in the UK, the UK government through Innovate UK, different hubs around the UK have been supporting uh, these innovators and startups quite a lot uh, for the last few years. But still, there is a need, more need for this support. You know, I'll just give you some insights because, yes, we had a stand at the at the event and uh, we we had the opportunity to meet with many of the startups in addition to those who we work with. Um, and although there, as we said, there are a lot of support and also you can see that 
banks, major companies, uh, governments, and others are bringing this support, bringing some funding into play. But you still see that major uh, number of startups and innovators are struggling to access funding. And, you know, uh, it's important to say, because you know, this is also like our kind of fight at, at CAP, at Cantor Advisory. Uh, we work mostly with startups and uh, with innovative startups that are bringing climate solutions into play. And uh, we work with them in a way that we become kind of an extension of their team to support them to become investor ready um, and take them through that journey until they get the investment and they get that push into the market. However, uh, through our conversations with many of the startups that we've met, that they are, they are behind them amazing, brilliant minds and bringing innov innovators, they are struggling into accessing funding. They are struggling into bringing their innovation into, into the market. Um, and this is because there is not much support. I have to say it. Um, you know, we've, we've met, we, so we were in an innovation zero last year as well. It's not the first year when it started. And last year we've met with amazing startups and we started working also with, with uh, a mix of uh, great minds. And, you know, some of those startups that we've met last year, they came again this year. And it seems that nothing evolved with them except that them trying to get more and more funding without having any success in it for a full year and their solutions were not able to actually being realized and get into into the market and this is really frustrating for them because you know it's important to to take into consideration that these entrepreneurs are taking risks and they are taking risks on all our behalf to bring this innovation uh, into play. Um, they're taking risks also in terms of money, in terms of their personal lives, uh, in terms of everything they believe in just to because they are passionate and they want to create solutions that benefits everyone and benefit the society. And these, these entrepreneurs, I think they shouldn't be under so much pressure as they are innovating and trying to create solutions that we all need, uh, not, even, not only now, but also for the future generation. And we see, you know, like the UK is, is doing a really great job in a way that different hubs around the regions, around different regions are coming together, are, are trying to support innovation, are uh, providing grants, are providing collaboration opportunities and bringing people together for partnerships. But still, we believe that there is a major funding gap and to be able to achieve net zero, uh, especially uh, whether globally or even here on, on, on the UK level, we need to come together closer and we need to, to make sure that energy companies as well as banks, uh, they come in and they support these innovations. We heard a lot of talks uh, from, from big energy companies and from banks about um, their willingness to, to support and their willingness also to bring smaller companies and SMEs uh, to, to support them and to, to enable them to bring their solutions into the market. But we need to see more actions and more steps taken and uh, towards that direction. Uh, this is this is, I think, very important uh, topic uh, that we need to even raise more and more awareness of it. However, I'll tell you also something really nice that happened at Innovation Zero is that they created this year uh, Innovation Zero Awards, and this was a very important event uh, where they, we celebrated groundbreaking solutions and advanced technologies uh, that contribute to climate action. And this was also very important and kind of like uh, putting a stamp from uh, a major event like Innovation Zero with the support of the, the Department for Net Zero and, uh, and Energy, um, putting a stamp on these groundbreaking solutions that will give them another level of credibility and confidence that will allow them to actually attract investors and more and more investors. And this is a very important step. And this also brings, brings out the importance of such uh, events and bringing people together and highlighting major technologies and in pushing innovation into the market. Um, and you know, like it's, I, I'm gonna also repeat myself, I think uh, again in this, the startups are at the forefront of innovation and they are taking the risk. And we call them like at CAP, we call them, these are innovation heroes, you know, because they are taking this risk and they are putting everything on the line to be able to uh, contribute with certain solutions that will be important for our future. Um, and you know one one more thing which is very important I think to add, which is uh, you know when, when we're thinking about transition, transitioning into a clearer, a cleaner world, into a sustainable future, 
this transition has to be inclusive and has to be also equitable. And we have to, to make sure that this is happening in a very equitable way and a very beneficial way for everyone. This was highlighted at Innovation Zero. And I think this, this only happened, one, when there are more opportunities to collaborate, two, more opportunities to partner, and three, more opportunities to actually for, for big companies and big, big banks to collaborate with SMEs, to collaborate with startups, to bring them, uh, to, 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 to really give them the funds that they need and the time that they need to achieve their solution. And just one support, because we talked about grants, uh, you know, the importance of grants from governments in seeding innovation, uh, which, which is important and it's, and it's also happening more and more. Um, and, and I think like moving forward, it's important that there is more collaboration between governments and investors uh, to come together and also provide more support for, for these startups. Um, and you know, uh, one one uh, good thing I think that that came out of uh, this event uh, mainly is highlighting how strong the UK is in leading the R and D side of things and uh, and and pushing the R and D worldwide. But uh, as well, you know, in in order to push this R and D further. Uh, we need collaboration on the level of governance as well, not only on the level of the private sector. So bringing all of this together is, I think, the key. And again and again, I will I will, I will say that these innovators hold the key uh, for, for innovation and for driving uh, uh, the climate fight and for achieving really a net zero future. Uh, but those, this is all in all, but I'm happy to dive uh, further into what we're doing and the importance of this funding and also the amazing startups that we've been working with. But, you know, I, I uh, just to say, thing, you know, we are a startup ourselves and our startup mission is to support other innovators and startups. And we know the struggle uh, of, of, of the founders that they go through. And, uh, and we know there are amazing innovations, especially in, in West London and in London as a whole. And we call up upon like SMEs and startups who are working and bringing climate solutions into, into the market to really get in touch with us. Because you know, for, for us, it's about like building things together and working together to grow together into this. Um, and, and we hope we can support as many innovators as possible uh, moving forward, because this is the only way forward really in, in bringing companies, startups, innovators, uh, governments, private sector, policymakers all together uh, in this fight, because it's, I think it's, it's our, our fight for, for ourselves and for the future generations. Thank, thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you. Um, we will be sharing slides at the end end of this if people are interested, and we can obviously put your contact details, um, in in that information. Um, and this leads on really nicely to Rob Ems from Human Sunlight, um, who I think Lisa and Rob have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to get him to be able to log on. I'm so pleased that's worked. Rob, do you want to tell us about the human sunlight journey? You know, how it, how, yes, it's an innovative idea. How did you get funding? Basically, tell us your story, please. So uh, thank you very much, Sally. Um, Mohammed, I just caught the end of your, um, your session there. So interesting stuff. So human sunlight um, is a startup, um, is funded by myself and my wife at this point. We uh, did look at funding early on, but were unable to uh, secure such a thing. Um, anyway, so what is human sunlight? Um, four years ago, um, I was based in Dubai. I'd been there for 10 years. Um, I was with uh, IBM out there in a, a sort of technology role. And um, four years ago, um, the pandemic was just starting, or was it five years ago? In you know, 2019. And we were watching... Uh, or the Emirates airliners um, basically ferrying from DXB, the main airport there to DWC, which is the new airport um, going to storage. So the UVC journey started for me right there. Um, my cousin back here in the UK um, is an ex-British Airways 777 captain. And he and I started talking on the phone, me in Dubai, him here. And we're saying, you know, aviation's closing down the world's closing down we need to we need to do something when I mean, we don't have capes or anything we're not superheroes but um we need to do something so we both started looking at the same time at uv light and particularly uvc um so ultraviolet uvc is a disinfecting germicidal light it uh, basically neutralizes and kills every known pathogen 
um, that man is aware of, uh, which is, is all of them, um, fold, uh, molds, bacteria, viruses, anything that's a pathogen is neutralized by uh, UVC light. So we got involved with that. I, I actually moved back to the UK in the summer of 2020 and I set up Human Sunlight in November of 2020. Here is a, a UK company. Um, but the early part of the journey, we were looking at UVC, which of course is harmful to humans. It, it neutralizes pathogens and does a great job with, with the pathogen killing, but it's also harmful to humans. It can damage your eyes and it can uh, damage your skin. We became aware of um, a new version. I say new, I mean, we've known about UVC and its uh, effectiveness for about 100 years now. Um, but there's a new version called FAR UVC. Uh, the FAR is because it's on the left-hand side of the wavelength of UVC light. So it's, it's short wavelength UVC. And it turns out through a lot of research through Columbia University in New York City and um, in fact, um, here in uh, Scotland, in fact, with uh, the guys at St. Andrews at University uh, who are world leaders in the photobiology departments in these, uh, in these universities, it has now been proven that far UVC with a short wavelength cannot penetrate the skin and cannot penetrate your eyes. So the first time in 100 years, we're actually able to have UVC on a short wavelength in the same room as living humans and cows and horses and birds and all living mammals. Um, there's a major step forward. Most of you probably haven't heard of far UVC because um, we are trailblazing um, without funding um, and singing and shouting about this technology every way we can. Now, let me give you a few examples of where we're putting the technology. So UVC, we sell um, to uh, several companies and individuals, architects around the world. They're actually on a UVC level replacing LED downlighters in buildings with UVC downlighters. So you have the white light for lighting and UVC uh, for disinfecting. This is standard stuff. So the white light's on when humans are in the room and the ultraviolet light comes on when the humans leave the room and then it disinfects. So that sort of pays some of the bills um, with the standard stuff. But with Fire UVC, we've got um, a live trial with Kellogg's in Manchester. They are more than six months into the trial. We're just swapping out some of the Fire UVC devices for them. What Kellogg's are doing, they have something that uh, can occur in, on the factory floor and in the nooks and crevices of the factory. And that's something called listeria. Listeria is a pathogen that um, will shut down any food production facility instantly. It is the enemy of food production. So they go around searching for this stuff. And when they do find it every now and again in uh, sort of these nooks and crannies, they treat it with far UVC and neutralize it instantly. So they are trying with other pathogens as well, but that's the main focus there. So we're in the final stages with Kellogg's, which looks promising for potentially this rolling out across their factories in Europe. From a sustainability perspective, which obviously is uh, what we're talking about today, if a food production facility has to shut down the listeria, everything, everything has to be destroyed. All the food, all the, all the stock, the machine shut down, and there's up to six months of intense chemical cleaning of that facility before it can even look to reopen. So Kellogg's are hoping that Far UVC can help them keep the factory open, keep the machines running, and keep the um, Kellogg's cornflakes and Kellogg's frosties on your kitchen table. We've got a, another trial that um, is just going into its second phase. This time is with a, uh, a poultry um, provider. It's actually the biggest breeder of chickens in the world. So 70% of all commercial chickens in the world are bred by Aviagen, a US-based company. We're working with them in uh, an R&D farm in Cheshire. And they originally spoke to me about 18 months ago. They were interested to see if far UVC can help in the fight against avian influenza or bird flu as we know it. Bird flu's not been in the um, headlines so much recently, but I've, I've seen some reports from the US where 
farm workers across the US are at, at danger from this um, particular virus, uh, not just in, in poultry settings. So with Aviagen, we're just going to the second phase. Um, they are using far UVC. Uh, they've got lights in the um, poultry sheds, which are generally cleaning the air of um, pathogens, keeping the birds safer. And also in the, the egg room, which is where the eggs uh, are produced and where the eggs are laid and where the eggs are stored before they're shipped out. And also for the, the, the chicks is where the, the chicks are born from eggs as well. So there's a lot of different elements to that. So, so far, very good um, with the trial. Um, as I say, we're in phase two now. That is from a sustainability perspective is protecting the birds, the poultry, and also the, the egg room, the birthing room, if you like, for the, the, the chicks when they're born. So from a sustainability perspective, it is actually helping with that environment. Again, if a, if a poultry farm shuts down due to uh, bird flu, the farm will be closed for about 12 months and will also be subjected to the destruction of the whole um, stock of poultry within that farm. Um, and also, again, the chemical treatment over a 12 month period, which is intensive before the farm can even look to start again. But from a human perspective, many of these farms are closed down with bird flu. They don't, re don't reopen. If they're owned by a very large company, that's one thing. But a lot of these farms are privately owned. They're under the banner of a, a big company, but it's still a limited company um, that are looking to stay alive and, and, and stay in business. So finally, um, the, the third area that we're now working in with, with Far UVC, just to give you some idea of the, well, there's a complexity of getting new innovations out there. So that's from sustainability perspective, but also from um, a light that no one's heard of that does amazing things. And there's, um, there's a whole process there to get people to buy into that, to trust the safety elements that have been already proven, um, but then to start adopting it into, you know, into society. So the third place we're working, thanks to West London Chambers, I have to say, is Heathrow Airport Limited. Um, we're working with Heathrow Airport Limited and Mighty, who provide their hygiene services. And this is the one that I think kind of ticks the boxes for the sustainability side of things, because we haven't started the trial yet, but we're probably three to four weeks away. The idea of the trial is, can far UVC light replace liquid chemical hand sanitizer liquid that is the question can that happen um so we'll start off with a couple of machines in the terminal buildings um so instead of going to a hand sanitizer unit pump the liquid it goes everywhere it comes in single use bottles plastic um and is chemical based of course um rather than you walk up to the far uv machine Palms down, palms up, five seconds, hand sanitized, exactly the same as using the liquid solution. So that is where we're at with, uh, with Heathrow and Mighty. Um, I mean, human sunlight, we're based in, in Datship, we're in Berkshire. Um, we are a small startup, a small business. But do you know what? When I left IBM, um, whilst I was still in Dubai, I thought, I'm done with software. I'm done with um, all of that um, corporate stuff, if you like. And I'm following a dream here, um, which is slowly becoming reality to get this amazing technology out to individuals who are open to look at it. It has to be big companies, I think, initially to, to really get some adoption going for this, this technology. And we're on a journey, me and the wife and no funding. Thank you. I take my hat off to you and the wife. Um, I, I just, yes, and that leads on so nicely to what Mohammed was saying. Um, it, it's, 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 it's absolutely not easy out there. And um, yeah, you, you, need, you need funding. Um, and I'm so pleased that we could help introduce you to, to Heathrow. You know, that, that's what we're here for. Um, fantastic. 
work from from all of you. Um, it's 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 been amazing. When I joined the West London Chambers, I was hoping that that is something that we we could do, and Heathrow was was very much a target for me. And uh, we are getting there. So yeah, one step at a time. But it, it's great to have you guys on side. No. And, and, and what I find love about these webinars is I actually get to learn and understand much better what everybody's actually doing, um, which is great for, 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 for me. Um, now, that leads on now to Ash Buttress. Now, he's a bit sort of the dirty end of things. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what, what we all do, you know, we all have our recycling bins. We all do it. My recycling day is, is Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Um, can you tell us, Ash, what actually happens um, from from Lampton, you know, from Hounslow Council's point of view? Yeah, no, definitely. What's quite nice is throughout the presentations, waste has been has been mentioned. So uh, is that shared for everybody? Can everybody see that? Brilliant. So uh, my name's Ash Buttress. Um, I'm the head of commercial waste at Lampton Services. We're part of the Lampton Group. Um, we're fully owned by the London Borough of Hounslow um, and we collect the domestic waste and we started our commercial waste business in July 2022. So we, we, we provide the, you know, the, the waste collections on behalf of residents and businesses within the borough. Um, we're based within the borough, uh, uh, South Hall Lane Depot, right on the outskirts on the west side of um, Hounslow, but we are within Hounslow. So we collect from 103,000 households uh, with a population of 288,200 people. Um, currently, we collect from 187 businesses uh, with 217 collection locations uh, to enable us to, to collect all the recycling waste from across the borough. For businesses and residents, uh, we manage over 50 vehicles uh, ranging from a 26 ton RCV right the way down to a cage vehicle uh, to do bulky waste collections. Um, and we've got over 180 staff that carry out the service uh, for the borough. Um, so the domestic or residential service, um, we collect from households um, or communal housing, whether it be flats, tower blocks, or flats above shops. Um, and the list of services uh, that we, that, you know, the waste that we collect is is general waste, which there is a common myth that all the waste that uh, is collected all ends up in a big hole in the ground anyway. Uh, this presentation is to highlight that kind of doesn't happen within Hounslow and it certainly doesn't across happen across um, the local authorities across, across the UK in my experience. Uh, so general waste, food waste, glass, paper, cardboard, cans, which are separated into steel and aluminium. Uh, plastic bottles, we do the garden and green waste collections, bulky waste collections, uh, small electrical items, textiles, and we now do coffee pod collections, which we've been doing for, for the last six to 12 months um, from households. Um, and how we collect those is um, if you live within Hounslow, um, you've got a black wheelie bin, uh, which is collected every two weeks for your general waste. Uh, we've got recycling boxes, um, your red recycling box is for your plastic and cans. Uh, your green recycling box is for your glass and glass and jars, and your blue is for your paper and card. Uh, there's also a green food waste caddy, um, uh, which we collect weekly, a fortnightly um, green garden waste collection with, for a ground, brown wheelie bin. And then what we're also able to do on those recycling days, we also collect clothing and textiles, small electrical items and coffee pods. Generally, if you put them in a plastic bag and put them on the top of your bin, we'll collect those as well. Um, and then on to the business and, and commercial waste um, service that we deliver. So we, we provide that to kind of any type of business within the borough. Our aim is, is to work with local businesses, uh, one, to kind of reduce their carbon footprint by using a local provider um, and also providing them with a with a um, I think, Nikki, you mentioned in yours in your presentation, it's all you know, it can be about cost as well. So we try and provide a, a cost effective service because in terms of our profit that we make, it's contribution. So it goes back to the local authority uh, for the profit that we make to, to, to enhance our local authority services. Um, so we're not tied to, to, to business types. We don't just want to look at kind of the, the, the large office blocks that are in that are in Hounslow. Um, we want to look at, you know, current but services that we businesses that we collect from our nurseries, offices, hairdressers and barbers, uh, local manufacturers, schools, um, businesses that are based on business parks, restaurants and any shop that is on any shop parade in and around Hounslow. Uh, and what we aim to offer is a total waste management service, 
Um, so some we deliver direct, some we use local partners uh, to deliver the service. So we can do bulky waste collections, including, including hazardous waste. Uh, we can provide skips and, and 20 to 40 yard rolling offs, uh, general waste collections, food waste, card and paper, plastic and cans, glass recycling and mixed recycling, where you can put your card, paper, plastic and cans into one container. And then that does go on to get recycled. Uh, collection frequencies that we offer. We can do that daily, Monday to Sunday. We can offer weekly, fortnightly, and monthly collections based on what a what a business requires. Because uh, based on waste generation, every business is is different. So on onto the onto the main thing that I, I wanted to to kind of talk about today is our material handling facility. Uh, there's a picture there. We're based just behind Costco in Southall and uh, next to Western International Market. And in terms of the domestic and the commercial recycling items that we collect, your paper, um, your cards, your glass, the plastic, the cans, uh, food waste, textiles and coffee pods and the small electrical items, they all come back to this local depot, which is based in Hounslow. Um, there's a picture there of a, of a 1979 Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, it weighs a tonne. Um, so the next slide just shows what we were able to process in March from Hounslow. So the material handling facility in Hounslow in March in in, in March just gone, um, we collected over one thousand five hundred tons uh, of recycling that we processed through the facility. Um, so in terms of card, that's four hundred uh, four hundred thirty six tons of card. So imagine that that's four hundred four hundred thirty six uh, Volkswagen Beetles that have passed through um, passed through our depot uh, in in the form of card. Over three hundred tons of glass. Um, 29 uh, tons of aluminium and 26 tons of steel. So what happens at the facility, all the cans and plastic get bundled together. Uh, they get put into a hopper and through technology, they then get separated. The plastic ends up in one bay, the aluminium um, cans end up in another bay and the steel cans end up in another. Uh, so 150 tons, uh, 100, 152 tons of, of plastic and four tons of textiles from the residents have put out on their household collections that we've been able uh, to recycle. So in terms of, of the performance, uh, the 2023 um, statist statistics are out. The 23-24 will be out in September. Um, kind of two key performance measures that, that the local authority use is is kilograms of waste created uh, per person. So so throughout 2023, uh, just under 300 kilograms of total recycling waste was collected per person, so per population based on the previous slide. Um, so each resident within Hounslow creates just under 300 kilograms um, of waste themselves um, a, a year. And, and based on our recycling rate, we can kind of average it out to, to currently 36% um, of that waste is, is, is then recycled. That can be through the forms of the glass, the cardboard, the garden waste, um, however that may be. We have got performance, we have got measures in place to, to, to increase that performance with the aim of getting to, to, to 40 and 50%. Um, but the, the, as you can see, other authorities in and around Hounslow or where I previously kind of worked within Oxford, they have a commingled service uh, where you probably get a higher rate uh, in terms of recycling. However, the, the quality of that material may not be as good de determined on how it then gets recycled. Um, so pretty much kind of, I know we're kind of pushing for time. So in kind of a bit of a whistle-stop tour of, of, of kind of what we do at Lampton, it's just a highlight kind of within, within, the, within the borough, you know, we do have a, a fantastic facility that is able to, to, to recycle the material. And I'd just like to finish. I've just got a, a, a two minute video. If it's just okay, just, just to kind of show that kind of highlights from when the, the facility kind of first opened. Um, and it just kind of shows kind of the size of the facility and some of the waste types that go through. So I'm just going to stop sharing uh, and then jump on to, to, to another screen. And one thing kind of, we discussed, um, um, as, as a panel before we kind of came online is that we are open for visits. So if you or your business wants to have a look and see what kind of happens at the facility, um, come and have some lunch and um, kind of have a look what, what happens and see what material and what, what products come out at the end and have a look at how they're tipped. 
you, you, you're more than welcome. And my contact details are there. And I'm pretty sure, as Sally mentioned, these um, these slides will be shared. So I'm just going to jump off one screen and, and then share the video for you all. So hopefully that video there just kind of showed kind of um, kind of the waste types that I that I mentioned and how it goes through the facility um, and comes out and bailed out at the at the end. So um, thank you for your time, everybody. And if you do have any questions, um, please, please answer away. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. I've, I've been um, lucky enough to go to the depot and it is, it is vastly um, impressive. So I do think we will be organising a visit for chamber members. Um, OK, I'm aware of time. Um, Alan, Alan is with us this morning as well. And I know Alan always has lots of questions. So Alan, over to you. Um, so f first of all, Ash, um, I I've got uh, three chamber members who want to come over and actually talk about either supplying equipment to you or buying product from you. So separate from a general um, visit to yourselves, I'd like to come over and seriously t sit down and talk some some business with you if i can arrange that separately no um, that, that, that definitely uh filter it through to myself i may not be the, the the kind of the person directly to um to speak to however i i can link you up with with the correct people alan perfect perfect um for, first question then in doing it in the reverse cycle of which you all spoke um so starting with you ash as the last speaker um why don't all local authorities collect recycling in the same way with the same color bins the same type of food wastage what why are you different to other people what what's makes everything different i think it's all based obviously there's leg there's legislation that's come out to make recycling simpler um that's due to kind of kind of commence in 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 march 2025 uh, we expected it to be more kind of um not so much simpler but to make everything um similar rather than simpler 
Um, however, it's made it's it's you know it's making recycling simpler. But to answer your question, Alan, I think it's all based on the the end sites um, that are in and around local authorities and what's based. Obviously, all all local authorities are different from rural to urban, different demographics, different locations, different kind of industries. Um, you know, kind of planning applications that are allowed in and around different areas. You know, for example, an anaerobic an anaerobic digestion plant for food waste. Um, there's going to be some people that will be off put about having those in their areas, even though they do serve a great benefit in terms of food waste. So, it's all about kind of location, um, demographic demographics. There will be an element of um politics in there as well. Uh, but to answer your question, I think it's because all local authorities are different in their sense of makeup that therefore um kind of dictates how that waste and recycling is then then collected so the the, the other question i've only got two for you that's right um, the, the other question is there's been lots of tv programs about what happens to plastics after they get recycled and separated at centers where, where do all the plastics from your center go to and what actually happens to them so all, all the recycling, all the recycling, the plastics from from our site, uh, they go to verified um, locations, um, whether it be in the UK or in Europe. But we're able to a little bit like it was nice to hear what kind of Nikki mentioned in their presentation. We kind of understand kind of cradle to grave. So we understand where our crate, where, where our waste is created and, and where it's then it's disposed of and all those sites and locations that that we dispose of our waste we understand kind of what happens to it um, and they are verified locations as well okay um so um thank you very much for that. we've Great. seen programs about whole warehouses full up with plastic bottles that have been crushed in china that all just sit there um it, and nothing happens to them china buys them <laughs> from recycling centers in the uk but nothing happens so it's really good to hear that you actually monitor to see that something physically happens with those i'll come back to you in a second sally yeah okay because there's a few more questions oh, for ash in, in the q a section all right let, so all right go on you you ask the questions Lovely. thank you um my, i'll my ask the other people the yeah, questions no, when you course, finish. yeah 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 no my question for ash was yeah but you might have asked it with the plastics the same with textiles what what happens to them once they're all loaded up uh they go to be recycled depending on the mm. quality um some are reused yeah uh, some are recycled and some some of the items are then shredded and then go to make a form of insulation um for 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 houses or whether it may yeah. be but you know the, the the items that the textiles that come in do get recycled into a, into okay. another product lovely thank you and a question Great from the great. audience um this is from um doesn't that, yeah from uh hold on Aya de Capena Ash thank you for the presentation um what happens with the composted waste i.e which are the third party suppliers you work with I think possibly you've sort of covered that yes so, so in in terms of the composted waste the, the the green waste we work with the uh West London Waste Authority um so I I know for example that the green waste that we collect goes to go, goes through um the west london waste uh, partnership and then that goes to in vessel composting and and together with our food waste that goes to an anaerobic digestion facility brilliant thank you okay that's me done alan okay back to me again all right um do you have any anaerobic digestion facilities or do you send them out further west say so, sorry just say that again alan do you have any anaerobic digestion facilities in the Lambton Group, or do you send those further west out to the other side of Heathrow and Oxford? Uh, they, they they currently um, part of the West London Waste Partnership. They 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 leave the borough once they're booked. But I certainly know um, it's an ambition of ours to one day manage our own anaerobic digestion plant. Okay, um, what well, one of our members produces those and exports them overseas and is looking to sell them in the UK. Um, M Mohammed, you, you mentioned about the need for finance. Um, we, we uh, and also, so did you, Rob. Um, it, we've got uh, a speaker coming along to one of our um, events soon um, who uh, is an angel investor in green, sustainable, new, innovative products. 
um, and he runs that company. He is the investor himself. So um, we might be the able to answer your request for green funding. Um, he's going to be speaking together with the Bank of England. Um, but more a question for yourself, Rob. Um, when you joined the chamber, um, one of the things you wanted to do was engage with Heathrow. You, you finally got there. Can you tell us about the journey that you went on from saying hello West London Chambers to <laughs> actually getting into Heathrow? What happened in that journey? Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, great question. So, um, yes, it was always my intention to get in with, with Heathrow um, through a recommendation to join the West London Chambers. Um, that was always the intention. So, um, early on, I, I had to really focus on um, the products, the solutions that we were working on, and constantly looking for something that was very applicable to the airport aviation scene. And we had some full starts with some early products we worked on. Um, but to be honest, um, a, a catalyst for this particular interaction was November last year. Um, I was invited to uh, apply for um, a free stand at the Heathrow Business Summit and um, through yourselves. And I was fortunately successful in uh, securing um, a stand I shared with one of my manufacturers right opposite the West London stand. And I had the pleasure uh, through West London guys and girls, um, the senior leadership of Heathrow Airport came to my stand, spoke with my manufacturer, they spoke with myself. And we had a conversation about hand sanitizers um, and a project we were working on uh, to potentially replace those. And they said, yes, please. We really are interested. We will obviously introduce you to mighty uh, hygiene services that look after such things for us. But we are very interested. And it's gone from there. I um, just to keep it quick, I um, got the, the product, the solution. Um, got a, a nice email together, which I shared with uh, with Alan, and um, he helped me get that email and the introduction to the right people at Heathrow. And they came straight back after Easter and said, brilliant, we're going to introduce you now to, to Mighty. Uh, please pick up with them and, and let's go. And, and it's really gone from there. And it's, it's happened so far very quickly. It's been a, a, a great ride. Hey. With Alan Rides. Hey, whoa. <laughs> so, um, Nikki, no, I'm not going to leave you out. Put that cup down. <laughs> um, you, you made the first presentation. It was really good. Thank you. And, and you hit upon a lot of really big points, um, especially the legislative part towards the end and the impact on local companies. Um, I can see the results on procurement services with the NHS. And we've done a seminar with one of the heads of procurement for the NHS who are looking for local companies to engage with them. But if local companies now need to show, verify and confirm their green credentials and what they've done over a period of time that's measurable, from where they were to where they are now to where they're going to be. Um, that's something that small companies are going to find very hard to do, to measure what they're doing, and then also to get an external company in to verify what they've done. And if it's now with the NHS, it will very soon afterwards be with everything for Heathrow if it's not already there. And then it will be for all local authorities if it's not already there. So how can you and your company help get people as an SME business through that cycle and end up with a verification? Yeah, I think you're very much right, Alan. I mean, obviously, NHS has done this. I think the Welsh government have taken off at that five million limit. I think the Scottish government are about to put it through. And definitely, you know, some of the different boroughs are looking at it as well. And, and it is worthwhile noting that every borough is very different in terms of what they're going for in terms of net zero, carbon neutrality, etc. So it does differ per borough. But the direction of travel is absolutely that, you know, to do tenders going forward, you need to have a carbon reduction plan. 
we very much specialize with SMEs. Um, so our main client base are SMEs. Um, and, you know, ultimately, partly because the larger organizations, they have sustainability teams, they're still often using external consultants because it is complex. Because in any one organization, you know, you are calculating one carbon footprint effectively if you're doing it yourself. And it's really hard if you're trying to do it yourself to kind of understand all the different information, all the different conversion factors, all the different calculations. What data do I need? How, what do I do once I got the data? It, it's kind of almost impossible. I've seen a few people try and get like tons of kilograms confused and have the most ginormous carbon footprint you can imagine, a small firm having a bigger carbon footprint than McDonald's that they published on their website. Um, so <laughs> it's really difficult. Um, but that's why, you know, what the reason I went into this was I was an accountant by background, so I'm you know data driven already. And then I was a COO, so I was always driving business efficiencies. And that's why the most important thing to know is that you know we generally work on a monthly retainer. Um, the retainer is sized depending on the size and complexity of the business. Um, but ultimately, as I said, most of our work is self-funding because you're finding efficiencies for that business and effectively driving them through. So we're just working through those four steps with them. We obviously do a few other things in terms of marketing, et cetera, but it's generally those four steps um, to ultimately get you to a point where you've got a carbon footprint that you can use for those reduction plans. Well, all I can say is I think it means that we're going to be seeing uh, quite a bit more of quite a few of these uh, presenters this morning, Sally, uh, yes. a few the seminars to try and get them into and do a lot more with the bigger companies, the local authorities in our areas, because there's higher hurdles to overcome and people are just going to come up against a roadblock and they need some help yeah. getting over yeah. those yeah. hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, back back uh, to you. Yes, I'm aware of the time. We've run over a bit, but it, it was a really interesting discussion this morning. There are a few questions in the q and A. I I think there's one for you, Rob, if you could have a quick look at that. There's a talk of a... Um, uh, a Honeywell product that seems a bit similar, but yeah, ha have a quick shifty at that if you would. Um, and then uh, Tom Levitt, I'll put you directly in touch with Nikki and um, Bridget from Rotary, probably the same as well. Um, I just want to say thank you very much um, this morning for, for giving us your time. Uh, the webinar has been recorded, will be on our YouTube channel very shortly. Um, thank you to Lisa for being behind the scenes and, and helping sort Rob out, get on, which is great. Um, please do not forget to vote and do not forget your ID. OK, um, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the rest of your morning. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Enjoy yourselves. Thank so Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.